I'm going to go ahead and start uh, now. A few people are probably going to trickle in. I just want you to, there's the bell. I'd like you to go ahead and um, answer the following question. So which chair are you sitting in today? Um, there are 25 different emotion choices. And if you would just go ahead and put that in the chat, if you feel comfortable, that would be great. I think I am also going to do it. I'm feeling 13, I'm feeling really centered right now. I'm gonna go ahead and also put a copy of the slides in the chat for everyone. If I could ask one of you, um, if new people come in, if you would go ahead and just uh, also just sort of put that link in the chat, that would help me. Um, I ran a little short on time in the last session. Uh, so um, we're just putting in uh, a number that represents our feelings right now. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Appreciate that. And so I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. So our norms here today for Zooming, um, the most important thing is the third, do what you need to, to make yourself present um, for this session. That's the most important thing. Otherwise, if you would help me out in the chat, that would be great. So if somebody drop in, got a few people trickling in now, actually, I probably can do it myself. Have it. There are the slides in case you don't have them. Right, so our outcomes for today are going to be recognize the pervasiveness and effects of trauma, define what trauma is and what it's not, understand what it means to be trauma-informed, distinguish between support tiers and recognize that we do have all support tiers functioning um, at Kennedy, although we can make them a little bit more robust, especially in tier one, and assess individual and school-wide trauma-informed practices. So to begin, um, we have our learner profile and statement of inquiry. The learner profile here is caring, and uh, our statement of inquiry you can read to yourself. So I'm gonna go a little bit fast um, so that we have the time to park the bus on the most important parts. And just knowing that all of you have access to this and can go back at any time. And all of you I wanna recognize have different levels of training and some of this may not be new to everyone. So I'm gonna move at a fast pace, but if you feel like you need to go back at any time, you have this presentation. So the definition of trauma by a substance abuse and mental health services administration is on your screen. I'll give you just about 30 seconds to read it to yourself before I emphasize a couple of key points. So about the first E, it's not just, right, some event that happens that can cause trauma. Um, it could be sort of ambient stress levels, racism, poverty. Um, and the key part about the second E is that it's experienced or perceived by the individual. So it is inherently subjective. What that means is that the same scenarios, the same inputs can cause trauma responses in some people, but not in others. So we can't predict who is going to experience trauma. Trauma lives in the central nervous system of individuals, not in the event. And that's key to understand. And the last is that when something raises to the level of trauma, it actually has negative effects, functional effects on people's physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well being. So that's our definition. Um, and that's going to be really important to carry with us. 
trauma is pervasive. In the initial screening survey that's you know really famous in this area of research called ACEs study, um, there were adverse childhood experiences. In 1997, the study was done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, and it focused pretty narrowly um, on middle-aged white middle-income people. Um, and it showed that childhood trauma um, very pervasive, or at least these ACEs, right? The adverse childhood experiences. Two thirds at least had one ACE and 12% had four more. Um, there was broad recognition that this was too narrow of a scope. And in 2012 to 2013, the Philadelphia ACE project um, added some to that. So its study included 25%, I believe, of the people involved were experiencing poverty. Uh, and there was a much higher um, demographic uh, in terms of uh, diversity of demographics um, in the city, uh, the city of Philadelphia as opposed to the original ACES survey. The first ACES survey looked at um, three areas of abuse, two of neglect, and five of household dysfunction. And the Philadelphia expanded ACE questions, um, which just by virtue of who they surveyed, took a wider range of um, socioeconomics and racialized statuses into account. Um, they added the questions about witnessing violence, um, the feelings, feelings of discrimination, adverse neighborhood experiences, um, being bullied, uh, as well as living in foster care to the study. And the results, as I um, didn't mention uh, when I was talking about the previous slide, were that seven out of 10 had at least one ACE and 40% had four more. So the key thing to think about here is coming out of a pandemic, <laughs> that is a, a mass traumatic event potentially. Um, it's an event that caused stress in pretty much everyone. And if you haven't experienced trauma, you know, consider yourself lucky or resilient. Um, but the opportunity for our society to have undergone <laughs> trauma at a level that um, we haven't seen in recent memory uh, potentially is even higher than it's ever been. So uh, our original ACES study was really an incomplete picture. And you can take a look at this slide a little bit more. It took into account household um, stressors, as well as community stressors and environmental stressors. But for a session that we're looking at here, there's one big thing missing, and I bet all of you can already guess it, school-based stressors. This is what we need to talk about. So I'm going to give you a second here. Please read the quote to yourself. So as you're reflecting, I want you, if you feel comfortable, to put into the chat, how might schools actually serve as sources of trauma? I'm gonna give you about a minute or so. You feel free to reflect individually, but if you're feeling like making this a brave space, if you would put it into the chat, what you're thinking. Yeah, bullying is huge, Cynthia, yeah, it is for sure, a source of stress for kids, a source of trauma for kids. Testing, <laughs> absolutely. Singling students out, for sure. And while we may single students out, and it's no big deal for some kids, for a kid who's undergone chronic trauma, we may see a response that we think it is not merited. No problem, Margaret. Yeah, COVID protocols, fear of COVID, absolutely. Microaggressions, absolutely. Pressure on kids for grades. Yeah, I was thinking about that's one of the ones that I had, grading policy. Um, what is our individual discipline policy? What is our school discipline policy? You know, we have curriculum 
content. And in the literature, they call it curriculum violence um, because there are times, you know, where we think about that as obvious if a teacher is not, um, you know, ventures into a, a, a topic of historical significance um, and is not fully prepared to address it in a way um, that's responsive. And even if they are, sometimes uh, there are personal connections and uh, familial connections that can cause trauma to people. Yeah, late assignment policies, absolutely, that can be a source of trauma. So as you're thinking about these, I want us to just be careful to avoid the deficit trap, right? So if I know that you've done some work in past years uh, on culturally responsive teaching in the brain. Uh, and, you know, there's this phrase deficit thinking that keeps echoing in that work, in Zaretta Hammond's work. And it's, you know, when we lower our expectations for students and individuals that we interact with, you know, because we feel bad for them, but that sort of savior uh, mentality doesn't serve anyone. It's paternalistic and it ends up having bad outcomes. So how do we not ignore the impact of trauma and then also don't define people by their trauma? You know, that can seem like a contradiction in terms. So the answer to that is to focus on fixing the injustice, not on the kids. And so I'm gonna read this quotation aloud, even though I know all of you can read because I, I want you to hear it aloud. It can foster a deficit mindset when we look only at how we can help students be more resilient without considering why they need resilience. And this is important because a lot of what I'm gonna share with you is gonna um, show how you can help kids to be more res resilient. But in the rest of the sessions moving forward, we're also gonna look at why children need to be more resilient. And maybe there are things that we can change where they won't need to be so resilient about that because that was something that upon reflection, we could do better on. So before we go in that direction, and that's gonna be the direction, the trajectory of um, the rest of our professional learning cycle, um, I want to talk a little bit about the neurobiology of trauma. Uh, and so again, um, circling back to some of the work in Zaretta Hammond, uh, you may know about you know, the amygdala and when people go into that fight, flight, freeze or appease, uh, and the reptilian brain is activated. You know, they've done brain scans to show that the blood flow to the cortex um, where our rational thinking happens is severely cut off when people have that stress response. And so when you're dealing with a student who has been triggered or even an adult who's been triggered, you know, the brain function, the cognitive function doesn't work the same way. It just doesn't. And so the response has to be to calm the person and get them out of that state before we can ever deal with them in a rational way. And so typical neurotypical brain will respond, uh, will observe inputs, uh, interpret the situation around them, process what's going on, evaluate their options, plan, and then act, right? That's the way we normally go about our lives as humans. But when we have our alarm system goes off and we interpret that there's danger in the world, right? We have this shortcut, this express route, so to speak. That is that reaction of fight, flight, freeze, or appease. And over time, when trauma occurs chronically, um, what happens is like what happened to you know that road out to the eastern shore. You know, there's so much traffic on us. You know, but over time, you know, that road got expanded, and that's what happens at a cognitive level. And these changes happen um, at a brain chemistry level, where um, that response, that alarm system response get strengthened over time so that what happens to children who have, you know, have been and adults who have been exposed to chronic trauma and stress, and more so to kids because their brain, their elasticity is even higher um, than ours, is that road becomes the main road. And sometimes things that wouldn't trigger people typically or in the past, you know, you see kids with this response that doesn't seem to make sense to you if you are not um, have not suffered from chronic trauma and stress in your central nervous system. So the important thing to take away here is that trauma comes back as a reaction and not as a memory. And that's important. It becomes so ingrained um, that it becomes a reaction that is unthinking. And that can um, 
be tough for adults to deal with when a kid is having a meltdown or is responding in a way that you it doesn't quite make sense to you. It's because it doesn't make sense. It just is. Some consequences of trauma you may see in your classroom, difficulty trusting others and seeking help, poor affect regulation, memory impairment, oppositional or antisocial behaviors, executive functioning deficits. These are all things we may be observing in our classrooms now to a, a greater degree than we've ever seen them. So we need to break the cycle of trauma because typically when trauma happens, emotional and physical damage occurs, behavioral problems become a response to that. And then in our society, we've typically you know, had consequences or punishment. And I'm not saying that that's not going to continue to happen, but when it does happen in a way um, that's not trauma-informed, you get a cycle of trauma that then reinforces um, that big escape route and you know, academics suffers, um, social uh, outcomes suffer. And the good news is that trauma-informed practices and care can break that cycle of trauma. And the one thing, if there's one takeaway, it's a trusting relationship is one of the biggest salves to help students through that. So this next slide, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on, but it takes some language that you may have heard in the past and it shows what that would look like, that same language through a trauma-informed lens. On slide 26 now, um, we're taking a tier approach from schools, um, in schools, rather. There's tier one universal interventions, which is where we're gonna spend all of our time. And we also have tier two and tier three interventions. So as you become an expert at noticing these things, um, most students we can deal with in tier one, you know, your relationships with them, your responses when, when to, to their responses um, can really handle most of the stuff. Um, however, if you find that there's a kid who has a higher intensity of need, um, we have our student well-being team to engage in tier two and tier three interventions. And so that's going to be on that is posted on my staff's own website. And as a follow up to this session, I'm going to email it out to all staff. The six main principles you can think about um, as you go are number one, we want to the principles of a trauma informed educator are empowering students uh, when possible um, and rather than disempowering them finding ways to put some power in their hands, fill that power bucket. It's really important for teens. Um, provide unconditional positive regard. So I want you all to think right now as you're reading through the rest of these, because I'm not gonna read them all to you, but I want you to think about one student in your mind right now, or an adult, that's fine too, that really frustrates you. Do you have that name? Just think about it. Don't say it out loud, don't put it in the chat. Just think about that one person, right? You have that name? Now I want you to think, what if that person is doing the best that they can right now with the tools that they have? It feels a little different. It's akin to when you see somebody cut you off in traffic. You know, and a good mantra is that you're not stressed out is, well, I, I think that person's on their way to the hospital because it feels different rather than just imagining them as somebody putting you or your family's life in danger by cutting you off on, on the beltway or something. We wanna really maintain those high expectations and again, be a relationship coach. Don't make assumptions, but instead really observe carefully uh, and question when we see behaviors and then try to, try to create as many uh, meaningful opportunities for participation as we can. On the next slide here, um, this is, I've read a, quite a lot of research uh, on this in preparation. Um, and I consulted with uh, somebody who works for the National Association of School Psychologists and lectures on this topic as well as our own school psychologist. Um, and in terms of the research, you know, show me uh, the stuff, right? G give, me the, give me the classroom strategies. I want the useful stuff. Um, it's in your in here and you can click on that link, but I'll also go ahead and put it directly into the chat. Um, view it later, we're not gonna have time to go through it, but it's got a, a whole lot of resources in there of what you probably hope for when getting into this session. Here it is for you. 
it's a lot. It's too much to really take in at one time, but bookmark it, make it a resource for you and come back to it. Uh, I just want to highlight a couple of pieces of it that I love. So aside from um, just having a lot of great text features, um, and I'm going to stop my share and share my whole screen now for a second. Um, you know, key findings and a lot of good infographics that summarize a lot of what is out there in the research. Um, I like all the way at the bottom here. Uh, this one's really good as well. Um, they even give you, what are the instructional strategies? Boom, seven instructional strategies. Um, in addition to these, these great um, little appendixes. So one is when you're seeing student behaviors that are in this phase of acting out, uh, they have the teacher responses that are the the most trauma informed. Uh, some of them, um, this was really another important one. So a de-escalation script. I know that, you know, I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old boy at home and I feel like they know how to trigger me more than anyone in the world. Uh, and so I know also being a good dad and being a role model for, you know, uh, emotional health for the kids, I can't get triggered, but I'm an adult, you know, I'm just like, but I'm also just a person, right? So I do get triggered sometimes. So Having a script that you can refer to um, when you're feeling triggered or having a good response, maybe you walking away and then coming back to it. Um, this is really helpful uh, for, for working with kids. And so it's there for you and, and refer to it. I would say, you know, bookmark it uh, and, and come back to this. So that being said, I'm just going to go back and share part of my screen again. Because I need to leave enough time to register for shape and take the TRS 1A. So um, our whole professional learning cycle is focused on developing a trauma-informed and equity-centered school. And so we need to have some baseline data on where we're at. And hopefully after the professional learning cycle, um, we'll, it will reflect in our own knowledge and, and self-assessment. Um, but this is also a great opportunity for you to think about what trauma-informed practices mean because it will ask you, are you doing these things? And you're like, oh, okay, I can easily do that and make that adjustment. So what you're gonna do, well, I'm gonna put this in the chat, but it's also available to you um, in the slides, is you're gonna go to this link here, theshapesystem.com slash trauma. Uh, and you're going to register. So it's going to look like this. Um, and the link is also right here for those of you following along at home uh, or in school rather. And you're going to create your shape account, register at an individual level, um, and then state is Maryland, obviously, and um, most familiar with school, uh, put in Montgomery County Public Schools and JFK High. And you're going to com complete about um, seven questions here for your registration to be complete, um, and then hit continue and activate your account. Uh, then you're going to join our school team. So, you, you know, on, when you come back to the page on the upper right hand corner, you're going to see join a team. Um, you're going to click on that. And then you're going to say, are you em uh, employed by the school? You're going to click yes and hit continue. And then I will, um, as the person who can uh, look at this account. I can assure you, well, number one, I'm going to accept you, obviously, uh, into our school. Um, but when you fill out the self-assessment, um, there's going to be, the only use of it is as metadata for the whole school. So you, individual results are not going to be visible by me. So you can really be um, true, truly reflective and be truly honest. Um, there's no way I can access your individual scores. Uh, then what you're going to do after you've gotten this far is you're going to, uh, the screen will look like this. Um, and then you're going to click on the last one or scroll down to trauma responsiveness. And then your screen will look like this. And you need to take all eight parts. Um, you may not be able to quite squeeze all of them into this period. Um, if there's, if you find you're running low on time, um, you can you can just uh, go back and loop back at the end of the day and complete those, uh, whatever you're not able to finish. Uh, and then I will go ahead and uh, at the end of the session here, put in um, this feedback, uh, and that is going to be the way I'm taking attendance for this session, um, as well as it's going to provide really important, meaningful data to me that's going to um, be included, uh, you know, from a data analysis standpoint, not individual data, but uh, schools metadata in different categories, um, so that, you know, that gets included in our school improvement plan as well. Uh, the last slide here I have is all sorts of additional resources if you just can't get enough of this topic. Um, 
and I've tried to curate um, a list of good sources for you um, that will help you out so that you don't have to sift through the whole internet. I've done that for you. So go ahead and register for SHAPE and take that TRSIA. Um, and the rest of the time, so we have about 30 minutes left in the session, which is good because the taking the SHAPE takes about 30, uh, 20 minutes or so, maybe a few extra minutes to register. Uh, and then taking the session feedback takes about four or five minutes. So we have just about enough time to squeeze everything in, but work at your own pace, no stress. I'm also going to stop the recording now. Um, thank you so much for your participation. I will still be here, but I'm just saying goodbye, I guess, to the recording uh, or my digital echo.